Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, may you have a blessed Ramadan. In the beginning, I would like to thank uh, the American Center for Research for allowing me this opportunity to deliver uh, this lecture, especially that it comes after a couple of days of celebrating the uh, the World uh, Heritage Day. And of course, I consider this to be a celebration of the prehistoric eras in Jordan. I would like to share my screen if you allow me. So welcome to everyone. I'm uh, pleased again, as I said, that I'm delivering today a lecture about the prehistoric periods in Jordan. It is not only a Jordanian heritage, but it is a world heritage as well. It tells a story of the human and uh, the story of civilization since humans stepped foot on the globe. Many sites, which I will mention today in my lecture, have great scientific discoveries that are quantitative and qualitative as well. And these are kept in our custody in Jordan. And we need to reserve them. This deep history proves that our roots in Jordan are deep. It makes us feel that our country boasts civilizations since the uh, ancient history. The number of archaeological sites, according to the surveys conducted in Jordan and according also to the information by the Department of, uh, in, of Antiquities, is uh, 140 sites. 60 percent of these sites are prehistoric sites. So it is, uh, it is worthy of discovering them and to learn who had lived uh, in Jordan uh, in these periods of time. In my lecture, I will not be reading these slides, but I will be explaining about these sites. In this lecture, we will uh, get to know about 40 sites. So therefore, it is very difficult to cover all the details of each site. However, I will give you an overview about each period of time represented by these uh, sites. And while I'm talking about these sites, I will mention the most important discoveries in these sites in order to not to go beyond the uh, time due to the strength of time. ACOR uh, will also indicate the, uh, the links of each site mentioned in this lecture. It will post the links on its website and of course this will help a lot in getting acquainted with these sites if you uh, are interested in learning more about these sites. Also, I apologize that I cannot actually mention the names of all of those who participated in these projects and the explorations. I've included the names of the project managers. However, I know that there were so many people working behind the scenes. Uh, so I apologize for not being able to mention all of them uh, in this very short lecture. So I shall start here in the beginning and in order to uh, give you the frame, uh, the framework of these archaeological sites, uh, which which I will be talking about them. Let me talk about the chronology of them. In Jordan, uh, the periods of time that uh, Jordan had witnessed uh, starts uh, from about 2.5 million until the 1.5 million, which is the old, fi uh, the old one area, which is one of the most important discoveries in Jordan. After that, we have the lower uh, Paleolithic uh, era which uh, ranges between 1.5 million and 100,000. After that, it is followed by the Middle Paleolithic era, which ranges between 100,000 to 40,000 uh, BC. 
and uh, also it is followed after that by the Upper Paleolithic Era, which ranges between 40,000 to 20,000 BC, followed by the Epi Paleolithic uh, Era, or what we call the the uh, the transitional phase, the Epi Paleolithic Era, which ranges between the 17,000 and it's actually 20,000, so there's here a typo. It's, uh, it ranges between 20,000 to 8,500 uh, 8, BC. Of course, uh, these are actually divided into uh, different uh, periods of time, uh, the early, the, the middle, and the, and the late. And then we have, after that, the early Epipaleolithic era, which ranges between 17,000 to 15,000 BC. This is a general map of Jordan, which uh, indicates the sites where the uh, Paleolithic eras and uh, the Neo-Paleolithic eras are represented in Jordan, especially the, the Lower Paleolithic era. Allow me, I will go through the slides very quickly in order to uh, finish within time. So the first site that we need to talk about is the Dogara site, which is located in Zarqa Valley in the north of Jordan. This site is very significant because recently a, a layer was discovered that goes back to 2.5 million years BC. Therefore, uh, being one of the oldest sites in uh, the continent of Asia. So uh, globally, it is one of the most important and the oldest sites in uh, the Asia and the Old Phi era. The Old Phi is, was known to be only found in Africa. However, after that, it appeared in China. Uh, there is about uh, 2, 2 million, 200,000 in Asia. And then in Jordan here, we discovered that the the period of about 2.5 million years BC. Of course, this had changed a lot. Uh, many of the information people had previously, and it uh, turned out that Jordan was a gateway between Africa and the world during that period of time. Uh, this map shows the, the chronology of course, uh, the majority of these uh, uh, sites were discovered in Africa. And of course, the red dot is the new site that was discovered by the Brazilian team. Of course, I'm not going to mention names of uh, individuals in this team. I'm very sorry for that because I have so many sites that I have to cover in this very short lecture. So I would, uh, I would thank all of those who have worked in these sites. Also, uh, in the same uh, site, uh, we have discovered uh, mammoth teeth. And of course, uh, the mammoth uh, is one of the animals that uh, was uh, uh, living during the glacial era. It is uh, from the beginning of the Pleistocene era, or the beginning of the period when uh, the uh, this animal uh, appeared. And of course, it is a uh, an extinct animal. Also in the same area or the same site, we found uh, some fauna of other animals that lived during the glacial area, including uh, the, uh, the boss and also one of the uh, ancient horses uh, species, uh, many of which are extinct at this moment. However, we found their bones in the site. I would like here also to, um, to, uh, to draw your attention that on each slide I've written the names of uh, the people who have worked in the site just to pay proper tribute to them. After that, I will move on to another site, which is 
the northern area of the Dead Sea, uh, or uh, what is called the Northern uh, Jordan Valley area. Of course, there is uh, an archaeological survey project that took place between 2015 and 2018, approximately. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, survey was conducted by Basel University in cooperation with the University of Jordan. This is uh, one of the uh, significant discoveries. Uh, one of the significant discoveries in this project is finding uh, finding uh, some uh, flint uh, tools uh, of the uh, lower Paleolithic era. And of course, uh, these are some of the rare items uh, or artifacts. And also in Tabqat Fahl, we discovered three types of uh, civilizations, I'm sorry, uh, three types of uh, the uh, three types of the lower Ashulian uh, artifacts, and also we had uh, the uh, Yabrudian, and it it wasn't known previously to be uh, present in Jordan. However, it was discovered during this survey, and that's why I felt it is very significant, and that's why I highlighted it. Uh, in yellow. Also, one of the most important things that were found in this survey is that we have discovered the Homalian uh, blades, and of course, uh, all of them were present in Syria, but we discovered that they are also present in Jordan. We did not know any sites uh, that had any, any uh, artifacts of this uh, uh, civilizations. And of course, when we talk about uh, the glacial period or the prehistoric uh, period civilizations, especially for the layman. Here we are talking about uh, flint tools or artifacts that were discovered in these areas or the blades. Uh, these uh, these uh, uh, blades were actually used in many of the in, in bringing the the raw material uh, and also building and uh, digging because the, it was the only artifact that they had. So the human at that time, uh, it was a basic uh, thing of life to actually create these uh, tools. Now in each site or each period of time has its own character characteristics and properties. Like, for, for example, when we talk about clay and we say that this is a Byzantine or an Islamic uh, clay, or that uh, belongs to any, uh, to any period of time, the same thing applies to flint because flint actually carries the properties and the characteristics of different civilizations. Whereas we can learn that the uh, human clusters uh, that lived in these sites, they had their own way of creating things and manufacturing. So here, when we talk about the Homalian, uh, which ranges between 250 to 170,000, uh, this period of time, the type of uh, fabrication is a technique that was also uh, available at that time that was used by a different group of people who lived also in Jordan. We had uh, so many different civilizations that are related or associated to the uh, flint blades and each uh, one of them tell the story of the people who lived there. Also, one of the projects that I wanted to just uh, mention uh, very briefly is that we have also an archaeological survey project that was conducted by the Department of Antiquities. Uh, in cooperation with EcoConsult, they have uh, surveyed the Lejun area and uh, prior to uh, starting the excavations. Uh, so the flint that was uh, retrieved from there uh, was given to me in order to analyze it. And of course, I was uh, very lucky to have Dr. Jeffrey Clark with me. So both of us have actually analyzed the uh, artifacts that uh, were uh, retrieved from there. So it turns out that the Lejeune area has uh, a lower Paleolithic era and also an epi Paleolithic as well uh, the, as well as the 
uh, Neolithic. Uh, so, and this is very great. Upon conducting the analysis, it turns out that the majority of these artifacts are uh, were present on the uh, at higher al altitudes of uh, Al-Jun, which we call the diagnostic pieces. Also, I was very lucky to visit uh, during one of the uh, survey seasons that were conducted in Al Jafar area. In this basin survey, which was carried out by, by uh, as you can see, the group uh, in the picture. Uh, Gary and Philip and Leslie and uh, Ahmed Lash. Uh, in this survey, I saw uh, the art the artifacts, and this is uh, a Syrian Assyrian um, artifacts. And of course, these are 1.5 million years old, or maybe older. So these are some of the artifacts that we discovered. What's also noticeable in this site is that uh, this is one of the lower Paleolithic area sites era sites and uh, this is an indication of uh, water presence and a large lake as well as water fountains geologically it is very obvious that uh, there was a big uh, presence of water during the Pleistocene era uh, the Pleistocene era in general we will see that uh, water and uh, lakes were present uh, everywhere and when, whenever we call something a, a basin, it was an old uh, basin or an old uh, lake, including Al Jafar Basin. Uh, this Al Jafar Basin, and this is the one as you can see in the picture, and this is one of the sites where they found more than 900 uh, different uh, biface. Uh, they found more than 900 bifaces, and of course, uh, many people uh, think uh, the, uh, these are transient cleavers. Uh, and of course, this, uh, this is an indication of the human activity that was practiced in the area. So if these are cleavers, then they were using them for slaughtering animals, and uh, of course, they were hunting at that time. Also, one of the important sites that uh, were discovered uh, uh, in the Paleolithic uh, uh, era, and so the site in Azraq is also one of the sites where the biface was also found, as you can see in the bottom, as well as the cleaver here, the transit uh, cleaver. Uh, so 90% uh, of the artifacts found in the site are actually cleavers, and uh, they go back to the late uh, to the late era of the epipaleolithic uh, the the environment where uh, we found also in Ain Soda we discovered many animals that have uh, already gone extinct uh, later on like uh, the zebra here and also one uh, species of animal uh, which is a uh, very close relative to the mammoth uh, these were also found in the area and as well as uh, the old boss here uh, that were living in during the Pleistocene era and of course uh, these were found in the excavations around the current uh, lake uh, in the area so these are some of the things discovered there also one of the uh, uh, the the, uh, the lower uh, Paleolithic uh, era uh, in Al Azraq. Uh, of course, uh, these uh, these artifacts were given to me by Dr. Ryan Bird, and uh, he did not write the name of the site. However, he told me that uh, he gave me actually the uh, the coordinates, uh, so we can we can go back to the site because we have the coordinates. However, this goes back to the uh, Pale uh, to the uh, to the Paleolithic uh, era and of course as you can see the uh, artifacts are very similar to the artifacts found in Ain Soda so it includes a number of bifaces as well as uh, cleavers then 
we can go back again to the south and uh, also from the Paleolithic uh, era we have also one of the sites here which is Tur Faraj uh, site uh, this is one of the one of the sites that were uh, discovered within uh, the Al Hisma project and of course this site was uh, different from the middle paleolithic era in Jordan is that in the other sites here they have uh, a Mosterian uh, uh, fabrication and of course it was uh, thought to be the Yandertal human at the time. However, the Mosterian uh, was of more than uh, more for the modern human. So the uh, researcher Jonathan Henry here believes. I'm sorry. So the researcher here believes that the distribution inside of the cave was was more similar like a modern human uh, distribution and uh, sectioning including also the artifacts inside the site we come uh, to another area which is Wadi Al Hassa uh, because we have a large number of sites within the lecture we will talk here about Wadi Al Hassa Wadi Al Hassa Lake uh, is one of the large sites and uh, several archaeological surveys were conducted there uh, one of the first ones was uh, for uh, was uh, conducted by uh, Pearson McDonald's and also Jeffrey and Nancy Collum and uh, Deborah. All of them have conducted surveys there. The number of archaeological sites in the area are more than 1,600. What we are seeing here, right, uh, uh, in this picture, is actually the. Uh, the bed of the lake. In the beginning, they thought that there is only one lake in Wadi al-Hassa. However, it turns out to be a, a number of lakes, all of which were present in Wadi al-Hassa. This is also one of the sites that uh, was not mentioned previously. Uh, we've conducted a survey, and we discovered that it is a site of a mine where they used to get the uh, flint uh, uh, parts uh, and uh, of course the the material here is not flint actually uh, but uh, I still need to analyze it to know what material it is made of it is uh, between flint and the and the limestone it's some something between them but uh, it is a more solid so I need to study the site more and uh, we will conduct the study in the near future. Also one of the significant sites that goes back to the middle Paleolithic uh, period is Ain Difla. Ain Difla is one of the sites where Jeffrey, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Clark uh, worked uh, and then uh, it was uh, complete by uh, Helico. Of course, the excavations that uh, Dr. Jeffrey Clark have conducted there, and he said that the site uh, belongs to the Middle Paleolithic uh, period. And when Helico worked there, also he discovered more than that, more than the Middle Paleolithic uh, period. Uh, he also found the the uh, the upper uh, Paleolithic. So. The, when we say the initial upper Paleolithic, it means that it has the features of the previous period and the later uh, period. So there is no uh, fine, uh, there is no cut between them. There is a transitional phase, whereas it would have the features of both periods, which which indicates that the periods of time are not actually. Uh, cut clearly we call this a transition between one period and another and it takes the features of both periods so this is one of the sites that has this feature an and and also this is an and this is also present largely in Tur Sadaf uh, Tur Sadaf is also one of the significant sites discovered in Wadi Al Hissa This site 
and uh, the whole layer inside the cave of course the cave is right here where my uh, where the era uh, where the era is and of course excavations were done inside the cave and outside the cave in this site we retrieved uh, we discovered the transitional uh, period and the artifacts that we discovered or retrieved were, uh, took the features of the middle paleolithic uh, and the upper paleolithic together In this site, Fox have uh, done his uh, dissertation, Jack Fox. Uh, also, one of the most important sites is uh, Thalab al-Buhaira. Thalab al-Buhaira site is one of the uh, sites that uh, are very, uh, very rare, the Ahwarian. And of course, uh, right now we are entering a new era. Uh, we are done with the er with the. Uh, a lower upper uh, the initial upper paleolithic uh, right now we have the early upper paleolithic uh, and of course it starts pure where the upper uh, the early upper paleolithic era appears uh, this is in the al Buhaira. it is the early upper paleolithic uh, usually these sites are very rare it's very rare to actually find an early upper paleolithic site so therefore this is one of the most important sites also one of the early uh, upper paleolithic sites is al hisma uh, we have al kelkha mount al kelkha mount is turfa was uh, however uh, al kelkha has several sites in wadi al hisma so turfa was is one of these sites uh, the Kilcha Mount and even the Kilcha uh, civilization is found later. However, Tul Kilcha or Tul Fawaz, is, uh, this is one of the sites there. Of course, it was reinvestigated and uh, we discovered a large amount of shells. that uh, are coming from the Red Sea and probably the Mediterranean as well. Also, one of the very beautiful sites where we discovered a number of artifacts, we have the Ansab site in Wadi Sabra area. Ansab site is located uh, near Petra, however, it is between valleys. So it's between Petra and Risha. Also, this is an uh, early upper Paleolithic, Ahwariya. This is also from the radiocarbon and the new excavations. Uh, what's uh, noticeable in this uh, site is finding a, a number of artifacts here which shows that there was a large number of people living in the area in addition uh, that uh, here we see that a number of people were actually fabricating uh, the flint uh, uh, nodules and tools inside the uh, the location uh, these are the shapes of some of the artifacts that were found in the upper paleolithic site also uh, uh, another site which is uh, one of the late upper paleolithic uh, period is Ain al-Buhaira site in Wadi al-Hissa Ain al-Buhaira site is one of the sites where we found the the Shtada blades, the Shtada blades are actually uh, very carefully manufactured and uh, Nancy Coyman, may she rest in peace, she believed that they used to be used here in this site. Some people said that uh, they were used for hunting, however they were probably used for uh, slaughtering and cutting because these are very small uh, blades. Also, one of the sites that we have 
within this uh, presentation. Mdammaq site. Mdammaq is located in one of the valleys uh, around the Petra region between Beida and Petra, the current Petra city of Nabatians. Uh, so there are the valleys. just in the area located between Petra and Beidla. Uh, this site was uh, worked uh, the first time by Diana Karkirad in the 1957, and then uh, Daniel uh, Shule have uh, worked in it again in 1983, and then after that, in 2011, uh, I've worked with uh, Deborah Olchiski, and of course, after we finished the season, Daniel came after us and he continued because he worked on the uh, upper uh, Paleolithic and we have worked on the uh, middle uh, Paleolithic, which is the Epipaleolithic. So uh, this site has two different periods. In this site, we can see several artifacts, several blades. which we call the packed blades. Or the backed, I'm sorry, the backed blades. So uh, these have different shapes and uh, they are considered markers of the period that actually uh, makes the distinction between the upper uh, Paleolithic and the Epipaleolithic. When we say the transitional phase, we mean it is the phase between the upper and uh, the Neolithic. Uh, some people consider that fabricating these uh, artifacts uh, is actually the marker and was the cut between the two periods. But I believe that the late uh, or the, the upper Paleolithic and the Epi Paleolithic and the end of the upper Paleolithic period, they should be merged together because these uh, blades, which are called the markerless, uh, appeared in these periods. They started appearing at the end of the upper Paleolithic period and did not only start uh, in the Epipaleolithic area uh, or period. Of course, there is a lot of discussion about this and debate. However, this is one of the main artifacts that was manufactured by human, and it is carefully and uh, very meticulously uh, manufactured, which indicates that humans were advanced enough to uh, fabricate them. Of course, all of the periods that we spoke about Uh, the people, uh, uh, the people who were uh, were working, uh, the people who were working there or living there uh, were actually hunter gatherers, so uh, they were not uh, also moving randomly. They were not nomads. These were human clusters, and they had strategies when moving. They used to study where to go and uh, uh, when to go, and they had the full awareness of uh, their surrounding environment, and therefore they knew the seasons of things and when they should move from one location to another and how and how many people. All of this was uh, carefully calculated, meaning that these people were not living randomly like many people believe. Coming to the early Epipaleolithic, period Mdammaga, Tabak Mdammaga is one of these, uh, is one of this uh, period, and we will continue with the Al Hissa sites. Uh, Al Hissa sites, we have a number of sites. The first one that I will talk about is Tur Sagir. Tur Sagir is one of the significant sites because it, it shows the transition from one period to another. Uh, we see in the, uh, we see in the layer, uh, the transitional features and uh, uh, the artifacts that uh, were present there they have the features of both periods the previous one and the followed the following one which indicates that humans at the time were not other 
uh, human clusters that were coming or different human clusters coming to these areas but uh, were the same people who were further developing their artifacts so they were taking the features of the previous era and then uh, adding more features so they were evolving so this shows that uh, Wadi al-Hissa area or uh, Wadi al-Hissa lake uh, this is a part of it Also, one of the more important sites is the Karak Plateau, uh, Site 75. This is one of the sites that uh, several uh, civilizations have appeared for the early Paleolithic period. And of course, the artifacts that have different names. And every name uh, indicates a different civilization. Uh, for example, we saw the Kalkhani uh, civilization and different names. And of course, the specialists know them. However, since I'm delivering a public lecture, I'm not going to enter into the uh, technical uh, terms. Uh, this is one of the backed uh, blades and it was used in hunting, some people say, and uh, some other people say in slaughtering. This is from the excavation itself. Also, uh, some of the uh, some of the sites is Matal al Hasa or Yutal al Hasa, as commonly known. Yutal al Hasa, uh, this site uh, showed the three different periods of time: Upper Paleolithic period, and the Epipaleolithic, and then also the uh, the late uh, Paleolithic. And of course, uh, this is uh, this was discovered in the excavations uh, conducted in the area. So there are three different periods uh, discovered in this site, and it is located directly uh, at the Wadi Al Hasa Lake. Also, one of the sites in Al Hisa is Tur Al Tariq site. Uh, Tur uh, Al Tariq has two main areas: the early Paleolithic, and also the uh, middle uh, Epipaleolithic. Uh, the Paleo uh, the Epipaleolithic is the same as the transitional phase, as we call it. So, uh, we have the early and the late um, eras, and of course, the artifacts in the early Paleolithic. Uh, uh, the, the early Paleolithic period uh, are different from the late one and the, the shapes are different and the, the shapes started taking uh, ge geometrical uh, shapes. Now we come to Azraq uh, sites. Also, we have so many sites in Azraq. However, what I'm showing here is that I'm going and following a chronology. I'm not covering all of the sites. Of course, there are so many sites in Jordan. However, I was, I was selecting the sites according to the uh, time period. We will continue after this early Paleolithic uh, area. We have the blades here. Again, these are the blades that I was talking about. As you can see, uh, th these are the blades that they were using. The, also, one of the important uh, sites is uh, the Gilat 6. Uh, these are from the early Pale Paleolithic area. Also, a very important period and a very important site was Al Kharani 4. Kharani 4. Uh, had uh, seen work for a very long time and over different periods of time and several people have worked in it. Uh, Dr. Mahajid Mahesan, may he rest in peace, started working there and after that in the 80s and then after that Lisa Maher and her colleagues started uh, came in and started working in that site. Now, as we said, uh, this is an early Paleolithic uh, or an early Epipaleolithic uh, including the uh, including it also the artifacts. However, what's uh, very noticeable is the open uh, site here, and we can see some kind of structures here or architecture. Uh, what's also noticeable in this site, or the most important thing, is we discovered uh, human remains. Human remains that go back to uh, 19,200 years uh BC and of course this is the oldest tomb in Jordan uh, we thought so 
uh, and we will see the oldest one in the next slide. Of course, uh, the difference is only 200 years old. So this is one of the oldest tombs in Jordan. Uh, the second tomb is in Al Qasir. Uh, it was discovered. Uh, this uh, uh, this burial was uh, discovered and to be the oldest burial in Jordan so far. Uh, it ranges between uh, 20,000 to uh, 20,000 to 19,000 BP. Uh, allow me to talk about this a little bit. What's uh, really interesting about this site is the uh, method of burial was uh, very uh, strange. It shows that this person was either uh, wrapped or uh, was shackled and then put this way and this is how we found the burial. The environment in Azraq at the time uh, had was teeming with, uh, with fauna. Uh, the types of the species of animals that usually live around water and lakes like uh, like uh, gazelles like uh, the foxes and uh, the rabbits as you can see in the pictures also one of the main sites is Ayun al hammam site Ayun al hammam site is a uh, a major site and it was discovered to have the middle epipaleolithic what's important about this site and the most important thing about this site is the discovery of the oldest formal cemetery in the world in this site so this is the formal cemetery in this site also what's what's exciting about this site is the discovery of the fox was also buried in this formal cemetery, which uh, indicates that uh, the fox has be was domesticated during that period of time. Uh, uh, it seems that it seems that humans have uh, uh, the the researcher Lisa Maher uh, uh, believed that the uh, the fox was actually uh, uh, so doc, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Maisun, we don't have uh, ta uh, time, so yes, I will go uh, very quick. So uh, this is another Another site, which is Al Hamma 27. Uh, this is Tabaka in uh, Wadi Al Hissa. This is Azraq 18. And we have also Shbeka, Dahra. Uh, this is uh, the upper. I'm sorry. This is the, the early uh, Neo, uh, Neolithic. And this is also the Neolithic. After how, after that we have Beda, and uh, we have Shkartim Said site, which is uh, close to Beda and Petra. This was uh, this was uh, characterized with uh, a circular, uh, circular buildings and structures. Also, we have Al Baja site. This is an early Paleolithic, uh, Neo -Paleolithic, uh, Neolithic. Uh, so this is where the humans started uh, being set, uh, started settling in the uh, rural areas. Uh, the people were uh, people during the the Neolithic. They became uh, settled and they started building the fixed uh, agricultural villages. And of course, the majority of structures are uh, are uh, squares and uh, rectangular. This is Abu uh, Khaila. These are other sites, and also Al Ghazal site is well known, and it is one of the main sites uh, for that period. Al Ghazal, 
uh, for many people that uh, do not know what's older in relation to these statues these statues are the oldest in the world and uh, they are made of gypsum and that's why I'm highlighting them in Ayn Ghazan the last site is Tal Abu Suwan this site on which uh, the University of Jordan is working on in Jarash of course it has the same history of Ayn Ghazal site what's exciting or noticeable about this site is it is the only site so far that uses the uh, grail building uh, so this picture shows that uh, it is uh, very similar to the Anatolian uh, sites and also here we discovered a large number of uh, full uh, human remains and also skulls that represent the different uh, burial techniques that people used and of course we have two skulls with plasters even though that the plaster is broken but uh, the there is residue these are the artifacts in the site these are students participants and thank you so much to everyone This is an acknowledgement of all of those who have participated because there are so many colleagues who have contributed and have uh, provided me with pictures and uh, articles for this lecture. Uh, however, this lecture has so much pro uh, information and it's very difficult uh, to actually cover all the information in such a short period of time, so I apologize if I have omitted anything but uh, I hope that in future lectures I would be able to cover more uh, and I wanted to also cover the sites of other colleagues so thank you very much thank you very much Dr. Maysoon uh, very informative and a great lecture uh, very amazing sites in Jordan uh, we have some questions that uh, maybe you can answer if you would like to stop your screen sharing Okay, so I believe that we can take some questions. Uh, if you are ready, there's a question from from two people. It is the same question almost. It asks you what are the main uh, ways of uh, actually identifying the dates of these uh, historic uh, sites, especially those that go back to 2.5. So the dating methods. The question is about dating methods. There are several techniques that uh, we have used. They use the OSL and uh, they have used also the bones uh, that were retrieved. Uh, they have used several uh, dating techniques, not one. Uh, what we have given um, an accurate date, uh, these were dated in the lab. Uh, those uh, sites that I've only written the era, it was only a relative date. Uh, they can also go back, uh, I'm sorry, allow me, uh, everyone also, every site was actually dated uh, using a different technique. So you can go back to the link of the site to see how it was dated. Because I cannot actually say how all these sites were dated. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, there is another question that asks you why you haven't found any artwork or any drawings related to the presence of these uh, clusters, knowing that they were settled in the area. So the question is about any artwork or any drawings in these sites. So have you found anything like that? In some sites, yes, there were some art. There was some artwork, of course, but I cannot cover or put everything that was found in the site. In the sites, however, there were so many sites where we found or retrieved artwork. But I wanted to cover things about the culture, and the civilization, things about their daily life, and not. But there are uh, artworks retrieved. 
only one question and then I have to wrap up because we have to wrap up uh, exactly on time the question is has these uh, ancient sites been uh, reused or have been uh, resettled in later on like the Holocene for example or was it very difficult uh, due to the weather especially the ancient sites depends uh, some sites uh, were occupied after that however generally speaking the the Hellocene the sites were not occupied later on meaning that you do not find a layer after it you find the layer on uh, on top is the Neolithic uh, layer however this does not mean that there are sites that could be underneath current buildings uh, so we cannot actually be certain however each site has its own features and char characteristics so, however according to my uh, knowledge the neolithic do not have uh, a reoccupation they might have been reoccupied during the same period in the neopaleolithic the upper paleolithic and then the epipaleolithic and then middle and then upper the same site however currently no uh, why? Because the environment has changed and it turned into a desert. Previously, there was water present and uh, animals and uh, plants, so that's why it was reoccupied. However, right now, uh, the desert areas are the Paleolithic areas. Thank you, Doctor, uh, very much for the very informative lecture. Thank you very much for answering the questions. There are so many questions. However, I believe Jackie maybe can send these questions later on to you and you can answer them at your convenience. Uh, thank you very much for being with us online. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you very much. I apologize for going uh, through the lecture very quickly, but I wanted to include as much as possible for the people to see how the sites look like at least. Even though that I haven't given a lot of uh, details, however, when you go to the link of each of these sites, you will see so much information and a lot of details. Thank you again for ACOR for inviting me to deliver this lecture, and thank you very much to all of those who attended. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.